Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Richard Murray. I'm a faculty member here at Caltech. Uh, we're pleased to welcome you today uh, to our interview with Bob Behnken. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Caltech's president, Tom Rosenbaum. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, it's an enormous pleasure to welcome Colonel Robert Behnken back to Caltech. Uh, Bob received his PhD in mechanical engineering with Professor Richard Murray in 1997. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that he is even better known for logging hundreds of hours in space, including numerous spacewalks on, on sojourns to the International Space Station. You may have seen him most recently in his role as Joint Operations Commander of the first crewed flight of the SpaceX Crew Dragon, splashing down in the Atlantic in August, or welcoming our first year students at Caltech's 2020 convocation. It is not every class that is exhorted to aim high, punctuated by a backflip in the zero gravity environment of space. Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, the Russian rocket scientist who worked in the early days of figuring out how to loosen the shackles of Earth, observed that the blue distance, the mysterious heavens, the examples of birds and insects flying everywhere, are always beckoning humanity to rise into the air. Bob Benkin has risen high, and we are privileged to have him join us today. Bob will be in conversation with Richard, demonstrating the maxim that a thesis advisor's connections to his or her students continue for a lifetime. Richard and Bob, over to you. So, uh, Bob, uh, great to see you, and thank you uh, for joining us today. Maybe we can start by just having you tell us a little bit about your latest mission. Yes, Richard, I, I thought what I would do is, is remind folks what happened earlier this summer. Of course, as was mentioned, I, I headed up to the International Space Station on what was a test flight of SpaceX's Dragon capsule, the first flight with humans on board. We went to Space Station uh, as the pilot of that vehicle and then ensured we got all the test objectives done so that the future flights could go off on schedule and we've got another crew who's up right now. And so with that, uh, uh, we're gonna jump into a video here and it will show what the launch was like, what the docking was like, and then uh, what it was like to get back home. And I'll say a little bit after that about the short time we had on board the International Space Station and what we did while we were up there. So let's uh, roll that video. Welcome aboard. Dragon, SpaceX, Comtrack, ground stations. SpaceX, Dragon, we're go for launch. Let's light this candle. Three, two, one. Ignition. Lift off of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Go NASA. Go SpaceX. Godspeed. On behalf of the entire launch team, thanks for flying with Falcon 9 today. We hope you enjoyed the ride and wish you a great mission. We would like to uh, welcome you aboard Capsule Endeavor. We do have a, a friend on board with us, Trimmer, the Apatosaurus. I think I was requested to do a backflip. Good night, Megan and Theo. And Karen and Jack. Houston flight. Houston is go for undocking and departure. Dragon is committed to undock. SpaceX Dragon on Dragon to ground. We are ready for the systems brief. Copy. As stated, Dragon's in a healthy state. We are proceeding toward the primary landing site and uh, your timeline is current. Two drones out. 300 meters. We have brace for splashdown. Copy, brace for splashdown. 
Endeavor on behalf of the SpaceX and NASA teams. Welcome back to planet Earth, and thanks for flying SpaceX. It's a, it's a humbling experience to be a part of uh, what was accomplished. It's great to see how excited everybody was. We hope it brings a little bit of brightness to a pretty tough 2020. Well, whenever I watch the the little pieces of that video that are that are captured, it kind of brings me back to those moments. So thank you guys for indulging me and, and let me watch it again. As I mentioned earlier, we spent a little bit of time on board the International Space Station, both to make sure that the Dragon capsule got checked out, but also to, to perform some activities while we were up there. It turned out that some batteries had been delivered on a Japanese cargo vessel a while back and, and needed to be installed. And so the other U.S. astronaut who was on board, Chris Cassidy, and I went out for four spacewalks and completed those activities. And once we had gotten those activities done and all the science that they were ready for, for us to accomplish, we took advantage of some good weather and made it back in early August. And, and just were really proud to be able to successfully fly again from the United States and uh, bring it back home to the United States. Cool. You know, obviously an exciting experience. I think one of the things that's interesting is it is the International Space Station, as you mentioned, right? You know, already there's sort of multiple countries. Can you say a little bit about how does, how does that actually work? How do the countries coordinate, right? You know, what's it like being up there? I assume the working language is English up in space. Uh, but, you know, maybe say a little bit about that kind of international partnership. You know, it's really remarkable, Richard, that the space station has been built with all the contributors that have been a part of it. Now, there is a Russian segment, an operating segment that's primarily operated by the by our Russian partners. The, the U.S. operating segment is kind of a conglomeration uh, with Canadian uh, robotic arms. There are modules from Europe. There are modules from Japan as well, all put together and then operated from control centers all over the world. So I spoke to Munich. I spoke to Scuba Center uh, just outside of Tokyo. I, I spoke to our folks in Huntsville in the U.S., uh, uh, of course, Houston, as well as Moscow. That partnership needs to work together to function as, a, as an operating space station. We breathe the same air. Uh, in some cases, we come aboard um, via the same vehicles. And so we had a U.S. astronaut who came on board with uh, Russian cosmonauts. That was Chris Cassidy's way to the space station and back. And Doug and I uh, came our way. But the crew that's on board there now, a, J a Japanese astronaut, he was able to fly the International Space Station, this time on board a U.S. vehicle. And so that partnership is pretty impressive in that in its lifespan. It's, it's spanned decades at this point. We've had the International Space Station in orbit as long as I've been an astronaut, which is uh, uh, 20 years at this point. It's hard to believe, but uh, it's just been a, a, a really great partnership, particularly at the working level and, and politics being what they are. The nations don't always agree on everything, but uh, I've always been able to rely on, on my cosmonaut partners or any of our international partners to execute the mission. Uh, even during the spacewalks, you know, the guys closing up my boots and making sure I was safe as I headed out the door where the cosmonauts were on board with us. And so okay. we literally trust our, our lives to them and they trust their lives to us. And of course, this is not your first space mission. It's your third space mission. I, I don't know, you know, whether that you imagine that, that you would, you know, kind of go up in the space three times. I'm sure you'll hope for that, I'm sure. You know, what was different about this one? I mean, you know, in terms of both, you know, the way the launch happened and other things, but, you know, in terms of what's happening on the space station, you've been on the space station before you got back. It's like, I'm back home. I mean, maybe say a little about how this mission was different than some of the others. You know, it's it's interesting, Richard. I think uh, we talk a little bit for from an astronaut perspective. Folks will almost go on any mission their first time. And <laughs> I, I, I say that a little bit jokingly, but, uh, you know, when you start thinking about are there risks associated with it? Are there challenges associated with it? Folks are really just excited to have a space flight opportunity. And, and I was there on my on my first flight. This one was very different from that in that we needed to go when we were ready. We were developing a new vehicle. We needed to make sure software and training and the teams were all on the same page before we tried to execute this mission. And so I'll say it was, uh, it was a, a little bit more um, measured, if you will, in terms of how we prepared for it. Because really the only people who were able to assess whether or not we were ready or not were not necessarily just trainers who were involved in the process. It was, it was us as the testers of this vehicle. Do we know everything that we need to know to pull off the mission? Have we thought of all the things that we want to have uh, thought of while we were on the ground before we were on board a, a rocket with a lot of propellant or you know, in the vacuum of space? And so that part was very different. The other piece that was different was working with a team kind of outside of government. So working with SpaceX was a pretty exciting thing to do. You know, it kind of 
moves at the pace uh, it, many times as uh, as graduate student life can, can move at. You know, you can, if your research topic's not going correct the right way or you have a setback in an experiment, you got to roll up your sleeve the next day and change it and move on. That's not typically how a, a, a government agency uh, works, right? Typically the government agency, it's a bureaucracy, there's a committee and everyone's got to come to consensus. Uh, if you're lucky, consensus can be built sometimes even. But uh, uh, as we go forward with the SpaceX team, it's, it's really been like, hey, that's not working, let's just change and move in a different direction. And so figuring out how to take our lessons and experience on the NASA side and inject it into a process that's uh, agile the way SpaceX was, was a, was a challenge, but uh, it was an exciting challenge to be a part of. Yeah, no, it's, it's sort of really fascinating. I guess one of the cool things about SpaceX, of course, is that lots of Caltech alums and others who also work at SpaceX, you know, one of them uh, is somebody you know well, of course, who's Garrett Reisman. So, so Garrett, maybe we can call up a picture of a Bob and Garrett uh, on, on uh, the space station uh, uh, just to kind of show you. So Garrett was also a Caltech student and was a Caltech student at the same time you were, but then later uh, ended up working uh, up at SpaceX. So maybe, can you say a little bit about SpaceX and Garrett and some of the things that he was doing? So there's you and Garrett. Uh, and this is, I guess, on probably your first mission, is that right? Uh, that's correct, uh, Richard. I think if you, in the pictures, there's actually a, we've got a, a suite of three of them. The first one I think is a, a line of graduate students and Garrett's at the end, uh, the short guy on the end. And, and I would say that if he's in the audience, hopefully he is. But uh, uh, our time you know, at Caltech goes all the way back uh, before those days, even from the graduation day, because we were in the same building there at Thomas, uh, living in the basement, if you will, uh, executing our research and, and, and moving on as we, as we went forward. Uh, interestingly enough, Garrett and I ended up on board the International Space Station together. We flew together on a space shuttle mission, STS-123, built a robot uh, a, called SPDM. It's a, it's a manipulator that the Canadian Space Agency put together that allows us to do some of the activities that previously had been performed by spacewalks. And then Garrett eventually, after doing a stint on space station after that mission uh, and uh, a follow on shuttle mission, went off to work at SpaceX and was a part of the team that put together the proposal to convert the cargo dragon in some sense over to a crewed dragon vehicle and led to the mission that I was eventually on. And so uh, on launch day for our demo mission two uh, that we flew in space uh, back, in, back in May, uh, Garrett actually was standing outside of the the launch area with a sign that said, "Take yeah, me with you." Yeah, I think you. we have a picture of that. Actually, maybe we can get Anya to call that yeah, one. It was up pretty exciting. Yep. To see yeah, him so there, and we weren't expecting him necessarily to have that sign, but uh, he definitely was with us uh, through the entire mission. And I, and I haven't had a chance to really talk to him since I got back with the pandemic and everything else that's going on. But uh, I look forward to getting out there and seeing him and his family. And uh, you know, when we don't have to wear masks and stay six feet apart, you know, giving him a hug for. What right. we've accomplished because it uh, was a, a long time in coming and, and he was a huge, huge part of it. Yeah, there he is. Yeah, there's Garrett with his take me with you. There's also an example. He actually put a you must be taller than this height to, to ride this <laughs> ride uh, actually in the white room, which is the room that sits outside the capsule when you're climbing in. And so it was a little joke and it was right up to his height so that uh, <laughs> if you were shorter than Garrett, then you couldn't climb on board. That's amazing. So one of the things I remember, Bob, you know, from when you were a graduate student, you know, you sort of came to Caltech probably in 1992 uh, and, I, you know, kind of met with you and, and you know, I always ask graduate students, you know, so what do you want to do right you know, after you get your PhD? Uh, and you said, I want to become an astronaut. And I said, okay, well, that's a little bit different. And I said, well, how are you going to do that? He said, well, I'm going to get my PhD and I need to get that in, you know, sort of three years is sort of the assignment. I can probably get another year, but no more than that. So I need to get it, you know, done within four years. And then I'm going to go off and I'm going to go to test pilot school and sort of do that. And then I'm going to go, you know, sort of maybe work at AFRL or something. And, you know, you hear this a lot when your faculty members go, yeah, right, that's the way it's going to work out. Sure, right? And that's like exactly what happened. So maybe can you say a little bit about, you know, when did you start thinking about becoming an astronaut? You know, you decided to come to Caltech. You, you kind of did everything. Maybe say a little about, you know, kind of here's what I was thinking and here's what I did and here's how it went. And did anything go wrong in your plans? To me, it looked like you did it perfectly. I don't know. I, I, I appreciate all that, uh, that confidence that you had in me, Richard, as you uh, – laid this out and then you give me credit for actually achieving exactly what I said it was going to do because I think, you know, in my mind, it was a, a little bit different and it was a, along the lines of, hey, I, I absolutely wanted to be an astronaut. And what I really wasn't going to do was close doors was, was really my intent that would, you know, prevent that opportunity kind of going forward. And so 
you know, I think it was okay to take a, I went through an ROTC program in order to be able to pay for school. That was really the way that I could go to engineering school. The Air Force wanted me to get a physics degree. I wanted an engineering degree. And so I, I ended up doing both and then uh, coming to Caltech and you, you had a, a, a teaching assistantship for me. And then I was able to pick up a NSF fellowship after that to kind of stay in school and find a way to, to pay for that. And then uh, it really, in some sense was, hey, I want to be an astronaut, but certainly when, when Garrett filled out his application was picked up in the 98 class, uh, by then I, I knew that I could do it because, uh, because he had done it. And uh, uh, so I, I made sure that I put my package in for the very next board and was selected while I was a student at a test pod school. And so for me, it was really about not closing doors. I don't, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, I had a discussion with the folks up at Pratt & Whitney or United Technologies at one point, and, and they had discussions of, hey, would you be interested when you finish your research, we are doing the rotating stall and surge control activities and, and modeling, and, and would I be interested in coming to work for those guys? And uh, you know, it's interesting to describe it right now because I'm 50 years old, but I remember telling the individual at uh, United Technologies that when I'm 50, it's gonna be way cooler to say I went to test pilot school and then I became an astronaut than to, uh, you know, and I can do uh, you know, a job at United Technologies uh, years from now, but I, I can't stay on this path and not close doors if I, if I, like I will close doors if I potentially go off and start working in industry right away. And so it, it, that, that's the way I looked at it. And I appreciate uh, you thinking I had a master plan and uh, was, uh, was that good, but uh, it was really about just trying to keep my options open. No, and I think, you know, that idea of just sort of, you know, taking the next step so that you have as many opportunities as possible for the next thing you do after that, you know, I think it's a great way to, you know, kind of look at things and, and obviously it worked out extremely well. So you went off, you became an astronaut, you, you sort of went on that first mission. Uh, there's some time between that mission and this one. What do astronauts do between missions and what have you done between your missions? You know, I've had a really kind of interesting career, I think, in terms of all the things that have happened. Even before my first flight, unfortunately, we lost a space shuttle. We lost Columbia. And I, I spent an extensive amount of time, you know, out in the fields of Texas here, uh, picking up debris and then being a part of the team that needed to come up with an answer as to what had happened with that before we could return safely to flight. And then once we returned to flight, there were a lot of activities that we needed to continue to execute kind of operationally in order to make the space shuttles as safe as possible as we continued to fly them. And so that involved inspecting the exterior of the vehicle, it involved developing techniques uh, during a spacewalk so that you could repair the, the heat shield on the leading edge or elsewhere on the vehicle. And I actually did a spacewalk with, with Mike Foreman on, on one of my flights where we took uh, a candidate material out and we practiced filling in tile samples and they brought them back and burned them in an arc jet to make sure that we had done a, a good enough job and that you could bring a space shuttle back with a damage of, of, the, of that type. And so those sorts of activities were, are, are really what my early focus here in the astronaut office was uh, between flights when I really wasn't training for a mission. After my, my second flight, it was an interesting time. You know, we were retiring the space shuttle. Uh, the flight opportunities were very much reduced. Of course, we were, we were looking towards flying other missions in the future, but we didn't necessarily have a vehicle that was ready to put, uh, put, put people on board just yet. And so, I served as the chief of the astronaut office, NASA's astronaut office for three years. And during that time, the only vehicles that we flew on were the Soyuz vehicles. And so I spent quite a bit of time traveling back and forth between Houston and Kazakhstan uh, to make sure that our crews were taken care of as they headed over and taken care of when they, when they came back and all the coordination that has to happen to build good crews as you, as you try to populate the station as successfully as possible. I came out of that position straight into the development world of, of the, the Dragon capsule, which was exciting for me. It was the dream of every test pilot school student, I'm sure, to be a part of the development and then the first flight of a, of a new vehicle. And, and I got a chance to do that. I don't you know. It's been so many years since that opportunity has presented itself. I, I know there's a lot of dreams that didn't get fulfilled, but uh, I was really lucky to have that opportunity. Yeah, and one of the things, you know, I talked about before, it's kind of interesting is that you, you know, kind of when you're not up flying, sometimes you're helping with some of the technology and, you know, kind of, you know, keeping track of what's going on in the development of the technology, which you might actually be the person that gets to go up and end up operating. I don't know if that happened in any of the kind of specific things that you were doing. It absolutely helped, happened on the SpaceX side quite a bit, you know, in terms of the spacesuits, the SpaceX spacesuit, that team did a, a great job developing a, a spacesuit from scratch. It doesn't use parts from, from other legacy programs and put them together in a Frankenstein fashion to, 
to build a new suit. They kind of, they went all the way from the beginning, which was a, a, a huge accomplishment for them, a kind of a, a new thing that hadn't been done for, for decades and by a team that hadn't been a part of doing it for decades, which I think is probably the most impressive part. Um, if you look at the EMU, the space suit, the white suit that you'll see folks do spacewalks in, that suit is, is very old. Um, so if you're looking at the pictures, you'll see the uh, space suit. It looks a, a pretty modern and, and clean. It's got the helmet kind of integrated. It's uh, 3D printed. It's got a, a lot of really cool features associated with it. And if you transition over to the, the spacewalking suit that we have, uh, that spacewalking suit is, is decades old from its design perspective. But the most impressive thing about it is that how well it does work and how, uh, how from a mechanical perspective, it's a very elegant solution. It, it, the pressure control that's in there, the pressure regulation, the, the backup systems, if you need to, rather than scrub carbon dioxide out, just augment with oxygen to get a good breathable atmosphere. All of the controls that go into that suit to make that possible are very, very elegant from a mechanical perspective. Um, and, and that I think is a, something that I always find fascinating, what people are able to accomplish without, uh, I'll use the word crutch, the, the crutch of a computer and an algorithm and uh, uh, cleaning it all up in software, if you will, uh, where you, you kind of have that luxury if, if these days with, with putting a computer in charge and, and going from that direction, you can, you can clean up a lot of poor uh, mechanisms, if you will. But uh, uh, those suits, have, both the SpaceX suit, they had to develop that elegant solution because you didn't have a computer on board it. Uh, much like we had to for the EMU decades ago. Right. And, and, and so the, the new suits that got designed, those are custom to you or they're kind of different, they're interchangeable somehow? How does that work? You know, it's uh, interesting. All the spacesuits are a little bit different from that perspective. So the spacewalking suit originally was a little bit more custom um, and has evolved since it lives on board the International Space Station. And a lot of different people need to use it to be much more modular. Um, the only thing that's truly custom about that suit is the gloves because hands are so unique for individuals and uh, those aren't even custom. I, I use uh, uh, what are called the Jeff Williams gloves from an astronaut who uh, arrived in the office about four years before me and uh, those are the gloves that fit me the best at the time and right. uh, I wore those. They, they did make a banking set and those became available uh, kind of very uh, close to the end of my spacewalking career. And so all my spacewalks have been done in the Jeff Williams gloves, not in the, not oh. in the, the, the banking gloves. The SpaceX suit itself is, is actually tailored to the individual. And so uh, that, that's the direction that they've chosen to go. I, I think as they, as they continue to have more customers and more people need to wear those suits, it eventually becomes uh, wasteful to kind of throw away those suits. And so you want to figure out a way to make them a little bit more modular or adjustable so that another person can use them, even if it's a flight suit that then gets turned into a training suit, the savings is, is pretty big to be able to just reuse that suit for somebody else for some aspect of it. Because in a perfect world, the suit actually never gets used, right? You wear it, but you never take it to vacuum or take it into a fire. You don't right. want any of those things to happen. So it's, it's uh, emergency equipment that you have on hand, but doesn't truly get used and so uh, using it by the, the a future crew is, is something that if you can do it, you really want to do. And so I guess you're wearing the, the SpaceX suit you're wearing, you know, while you're taking off and getting up there, get up to the space station, don't need that suit anymore. Go out, obviously use the kind of outside space suit for that. And so is it really just that one period when you're launching that you use that suit? The SpaceX suit is used both for the ascent phase when you're headed uphill. You know, that's a, a, a structurally challenging uh, period of time, you know, as you kind of manage the loads on the vehicle, as you go through the, the atmosphere and the, the loading just being under the rocket itself. Uh, then docking is the next opportunity, if you will, for another structural jolt. And so folks have a lot of discussions as to, is there really risk of, of puncturing a pressure vessel when you very slowly and perfectly yeah, bring okay. those uh, vehicles together smoothly so that they get docked? And so we typically wear the suits in that situation. Uh, as folks understand and manage those risks, that might not always be the case, but uh, that's what we did on our on our flight. And then when we come back through the atmosphere and come all the way down to splashdown, uh, there are there are some risks that are out there that are managed by the suit. Uh, one of which is if you needed to dump the atmosphere and you had hypergol or combustion byproducts ingestion into the vehicle, you'd want to be in a suit. So yeah, there's there's reasons for it, and it, primarily they're based on you know your pressure vessel not uh, being intact or if you had something you know that was toxic inside the vehicle, you've got another alternative atmosphere to breathe. Right. 
so when you're on the station, uh, you're, you're kind of, you know, they're doing the housekeeping things around the station, but of course, you know, it's a, a international space station that's doing science and their scientific experiments. What, what role do you get to play, if any, in, in kind of the science that's going on on the space station? I know a lot of our listeners are probably some of the scientists who are generating some of that and using some of that. Thanks, Richard. I, I appreciate you asking that question. I think sometimes there's a, a, a misunderstanding in terms of what we can do as astronauts. As, as you might imagine, the space station is a, a huge laboratory. At any given time, there are hundreds of experiments that are ongoing uh, on board the vehicle. And being an expert in every one of them to the point that you could be the primary investigator, the principal investigator, is, is just not possible. And so we typically uh, do our best to understand the research that's at hand but uh, also really focus on doing exactly what we're told by the, the researchers who put together the experiment so that we get them the highest quality data that we can. I, I think um, uh, that's one facet of it, which is really that uh, we're the hands and the eyes for investigators that are on the ground and trying to make that process go as smoothly and expeditiously and, and, and not waste resources that they may have uh, uh, you know, dedicated years to getting on orbit and coming up with a good plan for their use. So we try to take care of those things. The other thing that we're a big part of is that we're subjects of a, a lot of experiments ourselves. Yeah, right. And so whether it's blood draws or physical activities, whether they're measuring your, your cardiopulmonary function as you transition for different durations inside the zero gravity environment, uh, you know, uh, how strong you are on an exercise bike the first week versus the six month point, all that data is collected and, and folks look closely at that as well as how your bone density changes based on the exercise protocol that's been provided to you. Uh, so you're, you're a subject of as many experiments as you are the operator for, uh, right. maybe more in some cases. And, and I guess there are physiological changes that occur. You're up there for a couple of months, right? So it's long enough that your body starts to react to all of that. And so what there, do you, you are, know, how do you uh, handle that change? Yeah, there are, there are a wide range of, of changes and, and people are different, right? So there are different changes that different individuals go through. Uh, one that we watch very closely is uh, associated with your eyes. Uh, I think folks are, are pretty familiar, maybe are, I've heard a, the talk about the fluid shift that happens. Basically, your body's a big water bag. And when you're on the ground, the water part of it is getting pulled down towards your feet. And there's a, a sensor up towards your neck that uh, kind of manages what your overall pressure is. And when you get into space the first couple of days, you have a rebalancing of fluids. I'll, I'll leave it at that. You need to get rid of a lot of those fluids and uh, uh, that pressure gets managed. Um, if it doesn't happen exactly perfectly or there are, uh, there are other complications associated with that, you can get a buildup of pressure in your, in your head, I, I guess, and that can squeeze the back of your eyeballs in a way that uh, compresses the nerve and can create some shape changes, geometry changes in the back of the eye. That's, this is one example of lots of things that can happen to you. Your bones aren't loaded the same way, so they start to structurally change the, the voids that are inside the the lattice, if you look closely at the, the, the individual bone structure, starts to have larger diameter pores in it than it does normally. And so it's a little bit uh, hard to understand since we don't have a lot of subjects who've been through this and then got older, what the longer term consequences are of, you know, your, your bones physically changing in, in some observable way. Uh, is it just an observation of something that happens or is it something that, you know, leads to higher likelihood of bone fractures and things like that? And so I, I gave you a couple of example. There is a, a nice risk chart that I pulled when I was the chief of the astronaut office that has about 20 of these risks and how they're trying to burn each of them down in a way that either comes up with a countermeasure like exercise for the bone loss um, or the bone changes or is there a, a, a medication or a screening process that you can develop from an eye perspective? The, the, those things need to be understood well enough to you know, manage the risk associated with the Mars mission where you wanna stay in space for longer, further away from the earth and you can't get back if there uh, potentially is a problem. Uh, and so it's a, it's a very interesting piece of the research that has to go on board the International Space Station if you wanna continue you know, long duration space flight and other destinations besides just uh, low earth orbit. Yeah. So, you know, another uh, aspect of things, I think, is that when you go up there, especially on longer duration missions, you're away from your family. It's obviously a very risky thing. How do you prepare for that? And, and you know, you prepare for it in terms of you going up, but your wife's also an astronaut and she's going to be going up. And so you've seen both sides, right? You know, sort of being on the astronaut side and being on the family side. Can you say a little bit about that? You know, I've, I've seen both sides of that perspective in a lot of different roles. As the chief of the astronaut office, I saw spouses 
uh, or significant others and children kind of go through the process of seeing their parent or their, their spouse or, or otherwise launch into space and, and how they prepared as individuals. I, I saw my wife launch into space on a space shuttle. Um, I watched her go through me launching in space on a space shuttle. And, and in some sense, the space shuttle was a, was a little bit more of a known when we flew on it because there had been so many missions and it was uh, pretty well understood. And then I saw my wife go through me launching in space on the first flight of a new space capsule, which was another uh, level of uh, uncertainty or experience to go through. And so the way we prepared for it as a family is one way to do it. But the way that we did, it, I have a, a young son. He's, uh, he was six years old when we launched into space. And so a couple of years ago, when he was about four, we actually went to Florida and we saw a SpaceX launch. It was a cargo mission, but he was able to kind of go through that entire process of seeing a, the next time that you come down to see one of these launches, I'll be on board that rocket. And so at first, it was a it was a traumatic traumatic thing for him. He was not excited about me riding on because he could hear it. You know, he can hear the rocket thundering. He can hear all those things. It wasn't necessarily it was something he was excited. We'd been around rockets and airplanes, and that wasn't the scary thing necessarily until he put two and two together, which was me on the pointy end of that fire stick. And so it was a it was an interesting thing to go through. And then uh, once we went through it, and he got a chance to watch it. You know, we kind of came to the consensus that I could go and then mommy was going to go and then he was going to go. And so that's, that's the track <laughs> that we're on. And so we'll try not to close any of those doors for him as he pursues his master plan. All right. I'll start looking for that application to Caltech coming through. All right. Absolutely. So, Bob, maybe we can flip over. We've got a ton of questions from the audience. And so maybe I'll flip over and, and, and kind of pull uh, from some of those. So if you do have questions, again, if you put them uh, in the, in the Q&A box on your Zoom window, uh, we'll get those queued up and I'm sure we won't be able to get through all of them. But uh, the first one is from uh, Thomas Tao. Uh, he got his master's and PhD uh, at Caltech in Electrical Engineering, his PhD back in 1998. And he says, what, if anything specifically about your Caltech education prepared you to be an astronaut? And were there certain experiences that either guided you or provided some type of rare attribute that made you a valuable teammate? Um, I think from my Caltech experience and, and Richard, you'll have to indulge me in terms of uh, looking backwards at it in terms of, hey, the things that uh, were the most flowery or the, the, the best from my perspective, because you and I haven't really had this conversation. So it's uh, kind of a, hey, Richard, here's what I'm telling you was great about uh, uh, <laughs> right. uh, our experience. And anything I leave out, I guess uh, I'll throw you'll, it. you'll know what I felt about it. But uh, uh, at Caltech, I, I had the opportunity to be a part of both hands-on activity uh, both uh, uh, trying to accomplish experimental work as well as theoretical work and trying to bridge that gap in some way. And so in terms of uh, the, the value that, that I think that the Caltech education brought me was a, a, enough freedom to kind of find where my place was on that spectrum. There's a spectrum there in terms of folks that, you know, they're really going to be great theoreticians. They're really going to be folks that that's the way that their mind works and uh, uh, they, they don't necessarily need to put hands on things in order to fully understand them or, you know, putting hands on things might not be the thing that they're going to be most successful at. Um, I gravitated in a little bit different direction on that scale in terms of uh, uh, the, the value of the hands on experience, the, the building of hardware and trying to accomplish something, utilize physical phenomenon in a way that was uh, productive. And, and that's that's what I found uh, really valuable about the Caltech experience, kind of being exposed up to that whole spectrum and then finding where I fit on it to try to contribute as best that I could. And so that was a piece that, that I, I found really valuable. Um, I, I think that the, the other piece of it, just from an individual perspective, I think as a Caltech student, uh, there's a fair amount of a, a skepticism that you, you kind of take forward through your entire life and uh, it applies to technology as well. And so, you know, you get enough confidence that you are smart enough to understand the technology that's uh, in front of you. And if, uh, uh, if your life depends on it, then uh, you definitely want to be able to understand it. And I think that that perspective, if you will, uh, was something that, that Caltech gave me that confidence. And it also gave me that perspective that, uh, that I needed to ask enough questions that I agreed with the technical solution that was in front of us. Uh, there, there's a balance there because I can't build the rocket. I can't build the capsule. I can't operate the space station, but any sub piece of it that becomes too hard to understand that there might be a, there might be some smoke and mirrors there that uh, needs a little bit, a little bit more effort to, to kind of take it to closure, if you will. So, yeah, no, and I think that's very much the way I remember it as well. So, you know, uh, very much like that. 
Um, we have another question from uh, Demetrios Misios. Uh, he was a, a, a bachelor's student uh, in Page House. I uh, got his degree in engineering in 1998. Um, and he asked, what was your favorite task performed in space? And what was your least favorite task uh, performed in space? And, and how did you pass the time in space? So I think my most favorite task uh, in space was uh, spacewalks or taking pictures um, out the window. So the spacewalks were wonderful from a work perspective, you know, because it was it was the type of work that I enjoyed doing, and and I kind of was able to to do it a lot, which was uh, was pretty exciting, and it's a cool experience to kind of go through. Uh, I enjoyed taking photos. I know folks like to take pictures of of the Earth and and try to get the perfect uh, picture of some exotic place on the ground. I liked capturing pictures of sunrise or sunset or uh, a comet passing or seeing if I could capture satellites or to be able to see stars through the atmosphere. Uh, just just a different type of, uh, of photography, if you will, that was interesting to me. I, I have some good pictures in the shuttle days of uh, the external tank of the space shuttle just going into sunrise at the same time that it's going through a venting process, which I, to me, those are it's a hard picture to take uh, to be able to capture the venting at the same time that you capture the, the the tank at the same time that you you know don't get it blown out by the sun that's there as well so that that challenge was uh, was interesting to me so as far as the least um the thing i like to do the least i think in space I, hygiene I, and it's going to sound kind of strange but uh kind of the overhead associated with getting showered and getting cleaned up and uh when you're exercising a couple of times a day I, that was pretty monotonous for me, you know, just in terms of, hey, I, it's it's just something that you have to do, and it, it takes a lot of time, and you need to do it right because you're you're living with people on board the International Space Station. So it's it's both polite and you're going to be there for a while, so it's important to you know do those sorts of things. So I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't like that aspect of things too much. So that relates. To, Lee Higby asked, "What does it smell like in space?" You know, I I actually got to the International Space Station and came through the door, and uh, uh, in that video that was in uh, showed at the beginning there's a scene there where I'm, I'm giving a hug to Chris Cassidy and I got there and I said hey Chris it smells in here and he said people live here and so <laughs> that, it really it, it smells uh it smells like people live there if you will and so uh, that's what it smells like yeah like a dorm I was say, it smells like in the space station and in space it probably smells like the inside of your spacesuit I would imagine yeah so um another this is a question from uh, Matt Bennett up at JPL uh, and he asked on the Dragon capsule development work, uh, were all of your design inputs or requests included in the final design? Did you have to fight to get those design features included or were NASA and SpaceX very accommodating in terms of your inputs and requests? I think that, so there's a requirements document and how these processes really work is that uh, there's a contract that's involved someplace in there, right? And somebody's got to exchange money for services and uh, you got to be on the same page as, as far as how that's going to all play out. Uh, as far as our inputs as crew members, uh, we, were, we were in a position where we were the test and evaluators. And so if, if a solution was proposed and presented to us, you know, and we were gonna be the testers to say whether or not it was 100% or it was 0%, uh, that kind of gave us a, a, a leverage, if you will, to be able to provide feedback in a way that was going to you know, result in the changes that we needed. Now, at the same time, we, we really couldn't be uh, our way or the highway sort of a thing. We had to be open to, to kind of the description of what mission we were trying to accomplish and that, how that played into um, uh, the solutions that the SpaceX team could actually propose. And so, you know, we, we, we always have these jokes uh, as you go through the test pilot school, for example, that if you, if you put an F-16 pilot in charge of the next fighter airplane, it's gonna look exactly like an F-16. The same thing is true for an F-15. You put a fighter guy in charge of a cargo plane, you're going to get a fighter cargo plane that no cargo guy is going to want to fly. It, it's that same sort of a, a discussion. And so both Doug and myself, and we had two partners, uh, Eric Bow and Sonny Williams, um, their experiences and our experiences kind of came together. And we tried to present uh, a, a unified uh, position of, of capabilities that the vehicle needed to have. One of those capabilities was the ability to be able to be commanded to come back to the earth uh, independent of the ground. So that if you if you had an emergency and you just needed to press the punch out button, you could bring the, the vehicle back. And so that was one that we were not gonna be able to relinquish. We weren't gonna be able to go backwards on that one. And so when the solution came forward that said, hey, well, we're gonna modify it this way, or sometimes you won't be able to send that sort of a command, we'll block it out in software, you know, we had to have some hard discussions about 
would we take the responsibility as the crew to, if we had that capability to not misuse it uh, at the same time that they would take the responsibility to provide it. And so the technical details about how we got there and how we massage the software to get there in, a, in a, an elegant way that didn't require a lot of recoding from the cargo version of the vehicle uh, is, you know, is, a, is an interesting uh, discussion that uh, we had with the SpaceX team, but it was one that we had to have. And I think we came up with a solution that was implementable and you know, we got on the same page as, as what we were gonna do kind of going forward. So it was that, that, that challenge, if you will, of uh, from a NASA perspective, taking our experience and letting a team like SpaceX run and innovate and move forward, but at the same time, uh, identify where the, where the boundaries were that you needed a capability or there were a handful of things that you just couldn't, couldn't budge on and, and uh, to not have that be so many that you couldn't get the vehicle built which is sometimes the way uh, huge programs work out is there are just so many requirements that you can't, you can't achieve the mission. Right. So uh, a little bit of a follow-up. So Michael Stramenga, who's a first year graduate student in Galset, says, were there any lessons learned during the demo two flight that were implemented in the recent crew one mission or that are kind of scheduled to change in future missions? There, there are a handful of things that uh, we made suggestions about that are gonna be changed. There are also things that we knew and flew with that will need to be updated as they find the opportunity with the vehicle. You know, when you're going through the development and you're trying to meet a schedule for rotating crew and taking care of the International Space Station, it's, it's not trivial to just not launch anybody to space station while you wait for software changes to happen. You, you really do need to continue executing that mission at the same time as you allow for improvements. And so, you know, one of the big examples, I think, on the uh, demo two vehicle that we didn't have. We didn't have the capability to go to another place on space station. We had to go to a very specific port and get docked there. We couldn't go to a different location. The, the crew two or the, the crew one vehicle, which was the second crewed vehicle, um, not to be confused with the third crew vehicle called crew two, which my wife is flying on. Uh, that second vehicle taking people could go to a different port and they're planning to actually utilize that capability, but it was software that we flew without and didn't have that, and now they, they're gonna have it. So there, there are lots of those little things, things that we suggested, things we knew that we would like to have, but we were gonna fly without um, because they had a plan to get them on board. So um, we had a couple of questions that are related. So one of them is uh, from Slobodan Chuk, uh, who I know is Professor Chuk. He was a professor when I was at Caltech. He also got his PhD at Caltech, um, but also from Moya Chen, asking a little bit about, you know, kind of the differences of SpaceX versus other missions. So Moya's version of this is how do you experience how did the experience of training for space flight with SpaceX compare to that uh, prior experience you had uh, in terms of the training? You know, part of it is, is really about the, where we were from a career perspective. So both Doug and I are pretty experienced. We both had flown shuttles before. Done a, I'd done a bunch of spacewalks. He's a really experienced pilot, had flown the space shuttle in that seat a couple of times, operated all the robotic systems on board. Um, his mission was unique in that uh, his last shuttle mission where they got a lot of Soyuz training because in an emergency, there was a scenario where they would have had to come back on the Soyuz. And so we brought all of that to the table with the SpaceX team. And so for our first shuttle flights, we were really new, right? People told us how it was going to be. Uh, on this flight, you know, we, we were dealing with trainers that, that were great and smart and, and just did a wonderful job, but they had never trained a crew in space before. And uh, it they didn't necessarily have the experience for what we were likely to forget, for example, six months later. And so uh, we, we had those experience like, hey, I'm gonna need to be reminded about this and knowing our shortcomings and just generically what, uh, what, what crew training templates uh, are like and what kind of things people need refreshers on was an aspect that we had to help train the SpaceX team to understand you know, kind of the, what astronauts were, if you will, that they were trying to get ready for these flights. At the same time, the, uh, the SpaceX team was able to make quick changes uh, to things when we said, hey, software-wise, there, there's a hole here. We need to do something about it. Uh, they, they would address it in a way that, you know, it would take a dozen shuttle flights to get that change implemented, and we could get it changed, implemented between, between simulations in some cases. So that was yeah. awesome. Pretty amazing. And um, another question between them is, what about the ride quality? Was that pretty much, you know, launching from Earth is launching from Earth, and it all feels the same, or it was really quite different uh, on the you know, kind of space shuttle versus the, the SpaceX Dragon. You know, the way that we've described it is, is really about the ride quality that you get in a various cars. Um, uh, the first stage of the space shuttle, the, the very beginning of it is with solid rocket boosters or was with solid rocket boosters when we flew it. And that 
isn't something that is smooth. So you kind of, you ride on those rockets and, you know, they're dumping ammonium perchlorate out the backside and uh, they're burning down a grain and there's not a throttle associated with it. And uh, all of that leads to kind of a bumpy ride and one that you're really not in control of necessarily. The, the SpaceX rocket is a liquid rocket and uh, was pretty smooth the way the Soyuz has been described. Um, our experience that surprised us a little bit was that the second stage on the, on the SpaceX rocket, it wasn't terribly objectionable. It was just different than our expectations. And it was another liquid rocket, a single engine instead of nine, like it had been on the Falcon 9 when we were headed into orbit. But it was a, a bumpy ride. It, it's not under a high G load, so you can pick your head up. So it's not hitting the, hitting the, the, the headrest as you're actually riding uphill. But it was something that we we commented on, so that folks weren't surprised about it when they when they had the opportunity, because it was something that that surprised us. But I would say that I haven't ridden on all different rockets, but I would guess that probably the spectrum of rockets is like the spectrum of cars, where you can have a, a comfy a comfy ride in a seven series BMW, or you can have an old pickup truck on a gravel road, like we had in the second stage of Dragon or the first stage of the Space Shuttle. Yeah. So a somewhat related question. So Christine Moran asks, for aspiring astronauts in the audience, will the advent of commercial crew vehicles like the SpaceX vehicle change the selection process or the criteria for astronauts going forward? I do think that the selection process for astronauts will change in the future. I think that the skill set requirements are already evolving. Historically with the space shuttle, we always had military test pilots as a, a hard requirement. We had to get some number of military test pilots because military test pilots sat in the pilot and commander seat on the space shuttle. That's not true kind of going forward. Um, so we're evolving, if you will, to a, a different set of requirements. And so maybe a, a little bit more science background and a little bit less of that military pilot background is the direction that we're going. Really, when you build, build crews and put them together, you need to look at what the entire team brings to the table and make sure all the gaps are filled uh, as you try to go off and execute the mission. And there are lots of those gaps that need filling. There's the spacewalking piece, there's the flying the spaceship piece, there's the science piece that's out there. Um, I mentioned that we don't know all the details about the research that we're doing, but it, it definitely helps to have some science training um, uh, to, on board, for example, to, to really get the, the most out of the, the, the payloads that we typically fly on board the, the space station. So I see that evolving. The other piece that I see evolving is the number of opportunities, which has to change the requirements, right? If you have a lot more opportunities for folks to fly, then you'll, you'll potentially uh, rebalance, if you will, the, the set of folks that you, skill sets that you insist on when you, when you go to fly. And so my vehicle came back the SpaceX vehicle that I flew came back and is going to fly again for the crew one flight that my, or the crew two flight that my wife is on. Um, and that reuse of those vehicles, very much like the SpaceX boosters, which have driven the price down because the booster can be reused 10 times. And so uh, the second customer gets a discount from the one that the government bought the first time. I, I think the same thing is going to happen with those capsules, which should drive up the opportunities. Uh, you, you may have heard there's a, a company out there called Axiom and, uh, there's stories if you're if you're digging into the bowels of Reddit or elsewhere of uh, of Tom Cruise doing a movie in space and flying on one of their vehicles and so there's a lot of uh, opportunities that are out there but that opportunity is created by the reuse of these vehicles things activities like that are not going to fund their own spacecraft development but if a spacecraft is available they will utilize that spacecraft to, to do something cool with it. So Ezra, age six, uh, says I like math. So what type of math should I know to be an astronaut? I would say at six, you need to know all the math. Any math <laughs> that you're exposed to at six, you probably need to absorb uh, all that math. And uh, I have a six-year-old myself. My son and I are, are, are working through the math that he's been presented. I, I, you know, I, I struggle with the new math uh, and, and the details of that. And you know, what, are the, what are the 11 ways to make 10? And he's like, I don't think there's only 11 ways. I got a lot of ways. And, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. But Ezra, I would say it really is important to uh, stay interested and find fun ways to, to use the math that you are learning. If it ever gets boring, then uh, you know, maybe you can search for another way to learn it because uh, definitely math can do exciting things. It can get rockets into space. It can get spacecraft to the International Space Station. It can just do a lot of wonderful things. And so uh, if you're doing it and it's boring, then we should probably find another way for you to do that math. 
So uh, we have some uh, questions from Emerson, age nine, and Marcus, age five. Uh, and those questions are, what was your favorite thing you saw in outer space? What's your favorite memory from outer space? And are any parts of space scary? You know, my, my favorite memory or favorite thing I saw in space was actually a, a sunrise. And, and uh, that sunrise was how I captured a, a picture of a, a comet this earlier this summer. And so, you know, you have to kind of get the comment when it kind of comes out from the backside of the sun, I guess, was where the, the best place for me to capture it based on the timing of, of all the other things that were going on during our mission, where it was going to be and, and that sort of thing. And so the, the day that I set up the photography equipment and was able to capture that and then go back and play back the pictures that I took and realized that I had captured it was an, a very exciting thing for me. And I still look at that picture and it captures a couple of satellites and that sequence of photos that I took as well. So from my perspective, that one was uh, pretty cool because it was something that I predicted would happen if I took pictures in this very special way. And then lo and behold, it, uh, it played itself out. So that was really exciting. Uh, the most memorable thing that I was able to do was the spacewalks. Those are just uh, an exciting thing to, to get to 10 spacewalks and to do it with uh, you know, my partner, Chris Cassidy. He got to 10 spacewalks as well. Uh, it's gonna be a long time, I think, before we get two folks outside with 20 spacewalks of experience between the two of them. Yeah. So that was a, a, a pretty exciting time. It's, it's uh, when you go outside for the first time, you're, you're worried about doing it right. When you go outside for the 10th time with somebody else who's gone out for the 10th time, we, we were just were confident and comfortable in, in the environment and got to enjoy it a little bit more than uh, they'd be nervous and, and sweat about it. As far as scary, I think that the most scary time that I ever had in space was on my first space shuttle mission. Uh, we launched into space and on that mission, we launched at nighttime and when we, we launched a few seconds after liftoff, the computer told us that there were a lot of bad things happening with the, it had lost ability to talk to some of the things that it needed to talk to, to help us have a good flight into space. At the same time that a bunch of orange light came through the windows. And so the first thing that happened in my head was that the computers are telling me that the, the ship's not talking to the other parts of the ship and there's orange light coming in, that's probably fire. And so uh, that's not a good place to be when you're, flying into space, but it, it turns out that that fire, we, we did our jobs. We stayed focused on uh, getting into space and doing the mission. It turns out that that orange light was, uh, was actually our rocket plume inside of some clouds being reflected back into the spaceship. So it was our fire, but it was far away from us and it wasn't gonna hurt us, uh, but we didn't know that at the, uh, at the time. And uh, luckily the space shuttle had a lot of extra ways to talk to those other pieces of the space shuttle. And so losing one of them wasn't a big deal, but uh, happening at the same time was a little bit scary for, I think, all of us on board. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I was at that launch. You invited me. Thank you. And I remember that night launch. I can tell you they didn't tell us any of that on the ground. So none of that thing <laughs> us. It's all going perfectly normal and everything's good. So, uh, but anyway. Yeah, what we heard from the ground was uh, one comment that was, we'll have more words on those messages later. <laughs> and uh the, it's the way it trailed off kind of left us uh like they don't know <laughs> about what you want to hear eric Guerin, yeah. who's a, a, a an undergrad alum uh and a caltech associate asked something related and you said a little bit about this are there unexpected events that were highly stressful that occurred and could have led to panic if you hadn't been prepared and maybe also just how do you prepare for stuff like that you know, I think that for all the astronauts, and I, and I described this to the training team on the SpaceX side when we were trying to talk about how many times we needed to do something or to what level we needed to understand it. And, uh, you know, I'm going to, I always start to date myself whenever I start using movie quotes or, or movie references, but there's a movie with uh, Bill Murray called uh, Groundhog Day, where he kind of relives the same day over and over. And he gets really good at that uh, that particular day. And so we would like to get our our space shuttle, our space flight experiences uh, very much like that for all the things that are could lead you to having a bit of a panic, whether it's launching into space or going outside on the spacewalk. You wanna be comfortable with the actions that are in front of you so that you know, okay, in, in 30 seconds, this is gonna happen. In two minutes, this is gonna happen. I'm not gonna be surprised by things. If this happens, I know that what I have to do is push this button to start the fire extinguisher or I need to close my visor to protect the atmosphere. And those just all become normal operations and you don't think about the, the the panic piece of it because it's been you've kind of had it exercised out of you that experience i described earlier with the orange light and the computer messages all happening um, we all lived through that and we executed it just fine 
But uh, uh, seven or eight days later, when we played back the audio and the video that was in the cockpit uh, going through that phase, everybody who was on the flight deck who lived through it was glued to it, you know, almost like they were trying to, to see what was going to happen as it, uh, as it played out because they, it, was, it was that much of an emotional experience for us going through it. But in the moment, we had been really well trained and we just executed the activities in front of us and uh, it, it didn't miss a beat as, as we went forward. Yeah. We got time for maybe one last question, Bob. So I'll ask one that's a little bit of a combination of things. So you've you've been on you know several sp uh, shuttle missions. You obviously know a ton about uh, sort of an asteroid. Can you say a little about just how do you compare the original Apollo missions to the current missions, and and when do you think we might see a crewed mission to Mars, and what will that be like? You know, it's a it's a great question because when I arrived at NASA, we only talked about going into low Earth orbit to work on the space station. We really didn't talk about other missions that were out there, and I'm excited. You know, that as during my tenure, that it looks like we're going to end up flying three different new vehicles. So whether it's the Dragon capsule, the Starliner capsule, or as we go forward with the SLS and the Orion program and the, the, the lander system for the moon, all that stuff is uh, super exciting. I, I think NASA has advertised a, a pretty aggressive schedule over the next four years or so to try to get back to the, the moon. In my mind, having been through a five-year program in terms of how long it took us to execute it to get to the International Space Station, once I started really working on the commercial crew program, I think that the timeline of four years to get to the moon when it took us five to get to uh, the International Space Station is pretty aggressive on the pace that we're at. And so um, I, I think it's something that's uh, uh, going to be over the next decade, we're going to make those steps to go a little bit further out. And I, I do think that a stepping stone uh, back to, to the moon and, and trying to set up some sort of a facility there, either in orbit with the gateway or uh, down on the surface and, and kind of a presence that even if you're not there permanently that you can go and come back from is, is really what you need to prepare yourself for a mission to Mars. I think going straight to Mars is has got a lot of te technical challenges associated with it. And I frankly don't think we really understand well enough the effects on the human body to, to really pull that off safely. And so, um, uh, launching folks on a one-way trip to Mars, I, I don't think is a good plan just yet. I think that uh, uh, we want to work in that direction, but, but I think there are a lot of advances that, uh, and we don't normally think about it in, in this way, but I think advances on the, on the biology side in terms of managing cancer and, and things like that, it, they've come a long way, and, and those advances are going to help us successfully navigate both the moon mission, further orbital missions, and then on to Mars missions, because we'll be able to have the right uh, prophylactics in place in order to, to take care of the crews as they as they, they head off on those missions and take those risks. And so whether it's cancer that needs to be managed or it's detection of cancer early so that it can be acted on, all those sorts of things are, are parts of our puzzle to continue uh, pushing out. And so when we did the Apollo missions, they were kind of a, a, a jump to the moon and then a jump back. Um, I think getting a facility uh, on the moon that you can revisit will be just a, a, a super awesome thing. And, and I can't wait. And I think I'll, I'll definitely see that probably maybe not in my tenure as a, in, in the NASA astronaut office, but it's possible. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we all look forward to that future. And I think, you know, having you be part of it uh, will help guide it all in the great direction. So thanks, Bob, for taking the time to talk with us. Thanks to the audience for participating. Thanks to Tom Rosenbaum uh, for, for hosting us and to all of the people behind the scenes who uh, made all of this possible. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in person sometime uh, at Caltech as we get through all of this. And, and thanks and have a great rest of your week, Bob. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Caltech.